All right. Good morning, folks, and welcome to Friday Chalk Talk. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our guest, Dr. Savash Azarnia. Savash is currently a palliative care fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with quite a few ties to the Chicago area, having worked as a hospitalist at Northwestern Lake Forest Hospital, having completed internal medicine residency at Rush University Medical Center, and even having met his own wife on the L train. <laughs> And so the format for today is going to be two parts. We'll start with a presentation, followed by some time at the end for some questions and some commentary. And so with that, Savash, thank you for being here with us today. And I will hand the mic over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Warren. That was a fabulous introduction. <laughs> um, I'm going to look a little bit today uh, at mirtazapine and some current research uh, about uh, common uses for you know, why we use it in palliative care. So just you know, quickly, I have no financial you know, disclosures to speak of. Um, I, was, I had initially planned on making a joke uh, during this part about being uh, my like a goal of becoming the number one mirtazapine distributor in the world. And when I told my wife, she pleaded with me to leave it out. So I will, I will save you all from having to hear that. Um, just some quick objectives. Um, after this talk, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, or during this talk, I'm hoping to just do a brief brief overview of mirtazapine, um, list some common uses for why we use it in palliative care. We, 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 do, we do love it. Um, and then uh, look at a current study that was just published in December, 2021, um, that looked at mirtazapine and cancer associated neurodic cachexia, which is obviously a, a big cause of, of morbidity uh, in our patient population, uh, especially our cancer, obviously our cancer patients. And then I'll uh, leave ample time for discussion at the end to kind of just hear about all of your experiences with mirtazapine. Um, so as you know, mirtazapine uh, is a uh, FDA approved for as an antidepressant. A lot of good research out there showing that A, it's better than placebo, so great. But then also it's equivalent to any of the other standard therapies that we use. So SSRIs or SNRIs. Um, there's no difference between, um, you know, better, you know, there's nothing better they're, they're not better than mirtazapine. So um, it is an equivalent drug to any of those. Um, it's kind of in the realm of uh, antidepressants, it's, it's considered to be a little bit of a dirty drug. Uh, and that, I mean, it hits a lot of different receptors. So mostly uh, norepinephrine and serotonin, but also a little bit of histamine and also a little bit of, of dopamine. And uh, this is actually important for our situation because, um, because it, it's a little dirty and it hits so many different receptors um, and it's not selective, um, it causes a lot of side effects, which is one of the reasons why we, we like it so much. Um, so, you know, people are having issues with sleep. Well, it hits histamine receptors, so it helps with sleep. Uh, people are having some issues with nausea. Um, it hits 5-HT3 receptors, so it, it, can, it can help improve nausea and appetite. Um, and it's... Overall, um, it's, it's pretty quick acting. Um, when we're talking about our standard SSRIs, we're, we're talking about weeks and usually really months to get an appropriate dose and to see if people will get a benefit from it. But this drug within, you know, mirtazapine within days to weeks, um, you're really, people are starting to report whether or not they're, they're getting improvements. Um, the, you know, I've listed a couple of the side effects. I think it's really important to mention right there at the bottom, um, unlike SSRIs, mirtazapine does not have um, a noted sexual side effect, so decreasing libido. Um, and I think that's really important because especially in our cancer patients who maybe they're dealing with, um, you know, they're dealing with the, 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 the weight of their diagnosis and that's causing them to, to, to not be as, 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 you know, maybe as sexually active with their partners or, or you know, any other reason that could, could cause the decrease in libido. Um, the, this is a drug that will not exacerbate that, unlike the SSRIs. So it's just something to think about when, when dealing with depression and anxiety in our, in, in certain patient, in our serious illness patient population. Um, you know, why do we use it in palliative care? Well, it kind of hits on a lot of things that that we love. A, it's a drug that um, can affect a lot of different, you know, very um, bad symptoms. But then uh, on top of that, uh, it, you know, it can decrease pill burden because we get so much use out of it. 
Um, and uh, it's pretty quick acting um, and very, relatively well tolerated. So those are all things that I think um, can be really attractive about it in our, in our patient population. I do want to highlight uh, cancer associated anorexia and cachexia, and that's only because um, it's a relatively poorly un, uh, understood phenomenon. I, I was reading a, relative, a couple of papers about it, and you know, there's no general consensus about what what is the cause of it or the underlying cause of it. A lot of people, you know, the I think the most prevalent belief it's it's a you know in a catabolic pro-inflammatory state that cancer patients find themselves in. You can you can develop something like cancer associated cachexia. But uh, I, w I read one paper where they're saying like each individual cancer will have a different mechanism for causing it. And so there's no general consensus about what, what, is, what is that one cause or if there is one cause um, and it's not just multiple causes. And uh, this is important because obviously it affects the quality of life of our patients. It uh, worsens the morbidity and sometimes the mortality, mortality of our cancer patients. Uh, and so we're always trying our best to help our patients who are dealing with this. Um, the drugs that we have out there right now aren't particularly great. You know, so Marinol, I know Marinol had a lot of hype when it, when it first came out, but uh, for, personally, I, I've, I haven't had any success with Marinol. Um, Megase, which is, a, it's, it, there are some studies showing that it is effective. Um, I'm, I'm hesitant to give my hypercoagulable cancer patients a drug that can cause, um, you know, one of the side, main side effects is venothromboembolism. Um, and then steroids never meant to be given uh, for more than a couple of days to a few weeks max. Um, so that's not a great long-term solution for our patients. So um, looking at mirtazapine, uh, a drug that's pretty well tolerated uh, with um, uh, friendly side effects, like what we're you know, trying to tr uh, treat um, it's, it's, it's kind of our last, you know, big hope, at least for the time being until maybe something else comes out. Um, I did just, uh, highlight agitated delirium at the bottom, just FYI. Um, there was a study I read, uh, about mirtazapine being used in agitated delirium in dementia patients, and they showed that there was an increased mortality. So don't use it for, for that patient population. So... Uh, the paper that we're just going to highlight today um, just came fresh off the presses, Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, one of our Bibles, um, and looks at um, mirtazapine uh, in cancer-associated anorexia and cachexia. It's a double-blind placebo phase three trial, so it's, one, it's, it's the only of its kind. Um, there was a phase two trial studied a couple of years ago um, that was only about 20 patients, and it did show a, a positive benefit of giving mirtazapine for appetite. People um, gained one kilogram on average who, who, uh, who started on mirtazapine. Um, but that's really it. I think there was a pilot study that had about 20 patients, but nothing on a larger scale. So this, this trial um, takes a look at that. So um, the trial brought in 120 volunteers, 60 in a mirtazapine arm, 60 in an inactive placebo arm. Um, the dose that they gave was about 15 milligrams given at night. Um, no, you know, they didn't try 30 milligrams as well. I would have really liked to, to see if there was a dose response, but they, they just stuck with the 15 milligrams for the 60 mirtazapine patients. The main primary outcome they were looking for is, is there an improvement in appetite scores? So on a scale of one to 10, what were you at before? And then uh, let's compare it to where we're at after about 28 days. They did look at some secondary outcomes, so weight gain. Depression scores, obviously, giving them an antidepressant, see if there's any improvement in that. Changing quality of life, inflammatory markers, some other things. And then after 28 days, they presented their data. And so, you know, good news. Um, people who were given mirtazapine did show an improvement in their appetite scores. That was significant. Um, only issue is, is the placebo patients also got a significant improvement in their uh, appetite scores. And when they compared the mirtazapine arm and the, you know, the scores in the mirtazapine arm and the scores in the placebo arm, there was no difference, unfortunately. So um, it doesn't seem as though mirtazapine in and of itself caused an improvement in, in, in appetite scores. Um, although it does kind of note the power of placebo um, in, in, this, in, this, in this situation. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, though. There was an improvement in depression scores in the mirtazapine arm, and they did not notice the same uh, benefit in the placebo arm. 
So I think that that says a lot that uh, even in, in this study, we did see some but in mirtazapine patients, which is which is which is great. Um, limitations, uh, we don't have to go over that. But as I mentioned earlier, I would have loved to have seen you know maybe a, a 15 milligram dose arm and a 30 milligram dose arm just to see if there was a if there was a dose response um, that we might be able to expect just because those are common doses that we we, we prescribe in in, uh, in in mirtazapine. So as promised, I wanted to leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to have been able to kind of share with you my thoughts um, and, you know, how, how I've kind of, you know, view, you know, what, you know, what, you know, why we like to use this drug and then a, you know, how that might change, um, you know, now that this, this, this new research just came out. Um, so from you, I, you know, I'm just going to put a couple of things up. You can talk about anything you want. Um, obviously, I'm not going to restrict that, but uh, I'd love to hear just from you uh, what your experience with mirtazapine has been like. What do you use it for, and have you noticed success with it? Um, whether or not, uh, you know, if you have patients who have had cancer-associated anorexia, cancer, I'd love to see what um, you've used in the past and whether or not you've, you've, you've noticed success with, with what you've used, um, whether it's mirtazapine or not. Um, will this research influence or change your current palliative care practices? Um, why or why not? Um, and then just a, as a last note, I mentioned this here, you know, whether or not we actually need slam dunk evidence to, to you know, prescribe a medication for a patient. And I say that only because, you know, as palliative providers, we, we live in the subjective, right? We, we uh, uh, are constantly asking people, you know, how are you feeling? On a scale of one to 10, you know, our pain scores, what, what is your pain? Uh, one person's 10 might be another person's three. So um, since we kind of exist in this zone where uh, we're, we're going off of what people's subjective, you know, feelings are about a certain treatment, um, do we always need evidence to back up, you know, starting a drug that might, you know, we've noticed anecdotal benefit with, but maybe on a larger scale study, there wasn't. Um, so I'd just be curious to know what, what all of you think about that. Um, but like I said, of course, if you want to talk about something else that's not on this list, uh, please, please feel free to chime in. All right. Thank you. I, I've got a quick question for you and then maybe a comment as well. So if, if giving a placebo or mirtazapine is going to help improve appetite, how, how do you approach talking to patients about this? Do you tell them about the potential placebo effect? Do you withhold that part of the conversation? Um, what, what's, your, what's your approach when you're talking to patients specifically about mirtazapine and, and, and appetite? That's, that's a, that is a, something I thought about a lot yesterday when I was thinking about um, you know, that aspect of it, because um, as as I pointed out, and Jerry point, pointed out that um, there's no doubt that there is you know, that, that there is power to placebo, and um, it should be, um, you know, it, it, it's something that you know we have to take note of. I, I, uh, yeah. I, I always, whenever I talk to patients about mirtazapine, I always tell them that some, you know, I, I always say this. You know, some patients have noted a benefit in their appetite, and 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 I, I kind of usually will um, frame it as you know these are you know this medication has a side effect that of of increasing people's appetite and causing weight gain, which is terrible for somebody like me, but for somebody like you who's struggling, um, you know, to to keep their weight up, and um, that's you know risking you know you being able to continue treatment. Um, it might it might be something that works for you, uh, and so I always frame it as um, a percentage of patients will see this, you know, situation uh, uh, unfold. Um, that might not be you, but it's worth a shot. Um, and uh, and 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 then we just leave it at that. Um, and 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 I feel like um, it still gives the opportunity for placebo to, you know, if there if people are going to get a placebo response. Um, then, you know, I haven't, I haven't, uh, taken away that possibility. Um, so it's remarkable how many patients will respond the very next day to a treatment that should take weeks to make things better. 
Um, that's, that's a that's a classic SSRI. You know, if you after two days of starting an SSRI and somebody telling you that they've never felt better, then you you can you can, you, you know it's not the SSRI for sure. I love I love the paper, and I agree that I think there's a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, I just have a lot of respect for anything that works on the CNS, the SSRIs, the SNRIs, mirtazapine, Wilbutrin, and thinking about mechanism, uh, probably under-recognizing the falls, the injuries, the deaths that happen, probably because a lot of them happen in the community. Like, like a lot, there's a lot of data we're not looking for, or it's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, a concern that I have is a mirtazapine interacting with other medications. And, and, and I don't know if you have any thoughts, but okay, they're not sleeping, let's give them trazodone, they have depression. And the next thing you know is they're losing weight and let's give them mirtazapine. Mm -hmm. uh, putting the serotonin syndrome aside, right? That could get unrecognized, but any thoughts about, you know, mirtazapine and everything else from your side? And would you have any reflections on reading on the paper? Would you do something different? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't mention it just because of, for the, you know, for the benefit of time um, that I think five or six people dropped out of the mirtazapine arm just because of sedation. So, you know, I think, I think that's an important aspect of, of any clinician's, you know, judgment is, you know, am I going to be giving somebody something that's going to, um, you know, worsen their, uh, worsen their, you know, or increase the risk of something like falling or, you know, cause them to be, um, you know, cause them to be disjointed or discombobulated. I, I think those are, those are all really, really important. And I, I, I know exactly what you're, um, you know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about in terms of, you know, just kind of adding, you know, these, these CNS affecting drugs one after another, um, trying to hit different, um, um, you know, different uh, side effects or different um, symptoms, um, you know, and in giving individual drugs for each of those symptoms. So I, I think I, I definitely appreciate, um, you know, your comment about how, um, you know, concerning that that could be. Uh, I, I will say when I do start mirtazapine on my patients, I usually will will do look at all their other medications and I will, if there's anything that I'm, I'm kind of double hitting, you know, anything that's redundant with by starting mirtazapine. So if they're on something like a trazodone, I will usually stop that um, to, and, and, and see if mirtazapine can be just as effective for helping them with sleep while also, you know, hitting maybe some other, um, uh, some other symptoms that uh, I'm, I'm looking to start the mirtazapine for. Um, but I'm always, yeah, I'm always, I'm always very cognizant on making sure that when I'm starting a, like I said, dirty drug like mirtazapine, that I'm, I'm, I'm taking out anything that might um, exacerbate some of the worst problems uh, with, uh, you know, with starting a drug like mirtazapine. So, Thomas, we probably would all be better served to think more like geriatricians. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> But almost every study that's out there on mirtazapine, there's a sizable dropout arm because of that, because of sedation and because of um, more fatigue. Yeah, so that, that's quite prevalent, e even in patients that are more robust. And so I particularly am worried about our population. You're right. We like, we love to reach for drugs, don't we? Because that's what we do. Yeah, it's, it's uh, as, as with anything, you know, always, uh, always make sure that you're reviewing to make sure that you're not, you're not going to create a new problem, then uh, first, you know, harm. So Richard uh, had a quick comment in the, in the chat. He was mentioning how there's a different response depending upon your dose and how 15 milligrams and under tends to be more sedating. Um, I think the mechanism behind that for people that aren't familiar with it is that, or at least the proposed mechanism is that since um, mirtazapine 
impacts both norepinephrine and histamine, that at the lower doses, the histaminergic effect seems to be more predominant. And once you get past 15 milligrams, it tends to be a little bit more activating as the norepinephrine effect tends to take over. Um, the board review <laughs> question, if I ever heard one right there. Right. I, uh, I, uh, you know, I, 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 when I read this study, I, a, I was a, disappointed not to see that it had the result that we wanted. Um, but I thought it actually just gave a great opportunity for me and some of my co-fellows to kind of discuss, mm. um, just in a broader sense, you know, whether or not it, we, we cared that it, the study didn't show a great, you know, a, a better benefit in compared to placebo, um, and whether or not that would change our practices. So, um, and, I, and, I, and I do think that uh, this is a field, you know, cancer associated anorexia and cachexia is a, is a issue that needs continued exploration and uh, ways to treat it just because, um, you know, I think, I think that's, uh, I think it's one of those things that it affects our patients so negatively that any, any, any pearl or any way to make it better for our patients, our patient population is, is something I'm interested in exploring. So, um, yeah. all right. Thank you, Savash. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, everybody. All Thanks. right. Have a wonderful weekend, guys. Bye.